All right. So good morning, everyone. My name is Annika Lee, and I'm the Membership and Communications Coordinator at the Digital Technology Supercluster. And I am pleased to welcome you to our first Supercluster member session of the year, where intellectual property strategy can go wrong. Before we get started, we respectfully acknowledge that in Canada, we live, work, and learn on the unceded traditional and ancestral land of Indigenous people. As myself and much of the Supercluster team are based in Vancouver, British Columbia, we are gathered here virtually on the traditional ancestral territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. And we encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are joining us from. A few housekeeping items um, that we'll also throw into the chat that I'm sure you're all accustomed to now, but please keep yourselves on mute for the duration of the session. For optimal viewing, select speaker view. And finally, if at any point you have a question um, during the session, please type it into the chat and we'll address them during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. I'd like to now hand it over to Jen, our IP manager at the Supercluster. Thank you, Annika. Bonjour, everyone and welcome. It's wonderful to have attendees joining us from across the country in what is the first of a series of IP focus sessions that are planned for this year. Whether you're new to the supercluster or are a returning face, we're thrilled that you can join us for this power hour, where over the next 60 minutes, the discussion will include understanding contractual relationships, the importance of IP and investments for SMEs, the interplay between data and IP, followed by a demo of Fortress Legal, a multi-sided platform to securely manage and track IP, contracts, and corporate data, and a Q&A session to close us out. And as Annika has mentioned, we encourage you to post your questions in the chat for that portion. Next slide, please. A foundational component of the supercluster is collaborative innovation, setting the framework for projects that address cross-industry challenges while creating technology products that can scale across industries and ultimately across the world. The digital supercluster strategy supports the development, ownership and retention of Canadian IP through a number of vehicles and informational sessions with industry thought leaders like we've today is but one example of that. Next slide, please. I have the pleasure of introducing two exceptional thought leaders with us today. Please join me in welcoming Natalie Raful and Karima Bawa. Natalie is managing partner and co-founder of Fortress Legal and world-renowned expert in the patenting of software, business methods, AI, and machine learning. In 2020, Natalie was selected by IAM Strategy 300 as a global leader leading the way in the development and implementation of strategies that maximize the value of IP portfolios. Consistently ranked by the IAM Patent 1000 among the world's leading patent practitioners annually since 2014, she's also shortlisted as one of seven most highly recommended patent prosecutors in Canada. Karima is strategic advisor on intellectual property for the digital technology supercluster and was recognized in 2020 as one of the most influential women in the IP industry by IP World Review. She is the co-author of the Intellectual Property Guide, IP Literacy and Strategy Basics for Supporting Innovation, and a senior fellow at CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation. With extensive experience in strategically developing, managing, and leveraging intellectual property, Karima has had the privilege of managing and directing diverse legal functions, including serving as the former general counsel and chief legal officer for BlackBerry as it grew its operations from North America to over 175 countries. Wow, we're in for a treat today. Without further ado, Natalie and Karima, I hand it over to you. Excellent. Well, thank you for, thank you for having us. Uh, thank you for that intro, Jen. Uh, and thank you to the Digital Supercluster as well and to, to Karima for, for encouraging me to come out and do this presentation. So I'm going to share my screen now. 
and start the presentation. I know we have a little bit of ground to cover and we wanna do a demo as well. So get started here. So what we really wanted to, to jump into is where, where IP strategy can go wrong. And um, I know there's a lot of folks in the audience that are from industry. There's also a number of folks that are partners with industry from across Canada. So it's great to have you here as well, because even though you may not be directly applying some of this, uh, you'll be encouraging companies to be thinking through these issues. So what I wanted to do to start was really um, talk a little bit about uh, some of the major pitfalls I see with IP strategy go when, when IP strategy goes wrong. And so um, the first one, the first pitfall that I want to get into is just talking about public disclosure and kind of the oversharing problem I see so often. And so um, part of the challenge with, you know, developing an IP strategy and thinking more specifically about going after IP rights like patents and and um, managing your trade secrets, your, your competitive intelligence, your proprietary information is just making sure that you understand that public disclosure and having conversations with investors, with companies, with customers, consultants, um, that, that may be a barrier to actually seeking protection later. And so the way to think about it is once the genie's out of the bottle, once those ideas are out there, uh, they can't be put back in. And so clocks start, clock start, uh, there may be a race to the patent office, uh, trade secrets are no longer trade secrets if they're out in the public domain. So you really need to be thinking about, uh, you know, does the company fall into these traps of oversharing? You know, what, what do they talk about with, with early investors when they have those conversations with angels, when they're um, talking to customers about new product ideas? Like, what does that look like? And, um, and to be mindful of that because you cannot go back and be thinking about a patenting strategy if for the last three years you've been sharing uh, the details around that particular invention. And so then that kind of brings me to the next pitfall, which is, you know, companies will say to me, well, we have an NDA strategy and we put NDAs in place and we're very careful about that. Uh, but then when you go and you take a peek at the NDA, it's, it's often something that maybe they've grabbed off the internet or maybe they've, they've obtained this through a lawyer that doesn't specialize in intellectual property. And it doesn't include um, some of the very important aspects that you'd wanna make sure you have in a non-disclosure or confidentiality agreement. Uh, maybe it's an NDA with an individual. It's not actually an NDA with another company. So you signed it with the marketing person, but they weren't tied to the company or it's just with an in investor as an individual. And then that investor goes on to share it with some other folks. That conversation with those subsidiary folks or those other third party folks, they're not covered within that NDA unless they're specifically outlined as such. Uh, unless it says, you know, this company, any affiliates and so on and so forth, or they're, they're barred from sharing that information that you're sharing with them. So who is a party to the non-disclosure agreements? I see all too often that that's an issue. What does it cover? Uh, are you required to share information confidentially by marking it? Uh, a lot of the template NDAs that you'll pull off the internet require you to actually mark the information as confidential. Confidential. So you want to be in a position where you can, if you're getting into a situation with um, an investor or potential customer that you want to collaborate with, you want to make sure that you know you can just freely share information uh, without having to carefully mark things as confidential. And if you have to mark it as confidential, make sure that you have a process around that and you're very careful about that. And then you know when it comes time to you know no longer having that um, arrangement with whoever that might be, if it's a, a customer, a partner of some sort, how does that end, how does that relationship end when it comes to the confidential information that you share? Do you need anything back from them? Do you need them to destroy the information? Uh, so to be thinking about, I find all too often with all contracts, and I find this um, not just with startups but sophisticated companies, not thinking about how you exit out of a relationship. And this is really important from an IP strategy point of view is what does that divorce look like? <laughs> you know, how do we, how do we, un, um, you know, how do we part ways? And, and, and is, there, is there a timeline for parting ways? Maybe we just can't part ways overnight uh, and we need to stay, um, you know, there needs to be a connection there or a period to be able to, um, to, to, to unravel from that kind of arrangement that you have. So really be thinking about that. And then again, you know, another major pitfall that I want to outline in terms of, uh, and this is all again part of the IP strategy and be thinking about this, is your arrangements with your employees and your contractors. You know, now more than ever, uh, especially for digital companies, 
we are hiring contractors, not just in Canada, although we, we really want you to hire in Canada, but we're hiring outside of Canada. We're hiring in Asia. We're hiring, um, you know, in all parts of the world, great people in Europe, you know, in the U.S. as well. And so we need to be thinking about those contractor arrangements and, you know, what's the governing law? Is it governed by the law of British Columbia and federal law? Or do you have some other law governing those contractor agreements? And to be very mindful of what that means. If there is a dispute with that contractor, does that mean that you're going to be, uh, you know, going to to India to to resolve a dispute, or uh, you know, what 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 legal restraints apply? So really be intentional about that. And same thing with your employees, um, in terms of making sure that those agreements are writing. All too often, I see folks onboarding employees, and there is nothing in there about intellectual property, or there might be a very basic clause in there, but it doesn't cover things like inventions, what happens with patents. Does the employee have an obligation to sign paperwork even after they leave? Because we know in this type of job market that people are coming and going. And in, you know, in a year or two years from now, you know, that great engineer that you had on board in your team may not be there. And that patent exists for 20 years. And so if you are filing for patent protection or any other form of, of IP, uh, you may you may need to ensure, you want to ensure that there's an obligation for them to cooperate later on for signatures. So ha having those kinds of protections in there, because you know, as you grow as a company, you may not be patenting now as a, as a smaller company, but later on as you move into that, you're not revisiting those. And you need to make sure that um, you have an obligation for them to cooperate even after uh, they are no longer with the company. And I'm actually dealing with that issue right now where we're now having to go through a whole rigmarole with the US Patent Office in terms of getting petition, getting a petition in place to uh, around this uncooperative uh, inventor now. So it creates a whole bunch of uh, paperwork, <laughs> creates more fees for lawyers, and that's really not what you want. So making sure that you're really thinking about setting up a really good employee uh, template agreement that really covers off your intellectual property rights properly, that you waive those moral rights, uh, that is particularly important for software to make sure that there are no residual moral rights that can be associated with your developers. So just ask your attorney about moral rights, make sure that they are in your employment agreements and contractor agreements and be thinking about some of those issues as well. Um, and then, you know, another major pitfall that I that, that I want to highlight again is that is, is joint ventures and collaborations. I mean, so often uh, companies are looking to partner uh, with other companies to provide integrated solutions uh, or to plug into something that, you know, their customer is doing. And, and how does that how is that arrangement going to work um how will you later work with competitors so if you are deciding to get involved with one company through a joint venture or some kind of collaboration or partnership what does that mean for working with other companies and you know are there limitations around that are there any exclusive um rights that this new collaborator gets that will prevent you from working with others what are you sharing what are you licensing we talked about the 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 you know the the interplay between data and ip well, you know, intellectual property and ideas are, are being built in the digital space off the use of data, right? You're getting access to incredible data sets. But then off of those data sets, what are you doing? You're building algorithms, you're processing that data, right? You're taking that raw data, maybe you're getting from a partner um, or someone you're in a joint venture with, you're processing that, you're training models, uh, you're creating new ideas. Well, who owns those new ideas? You know, what is that, what does the agreement look like with uh, that partner? And um, once you are no longer working together a year or two years later, you know, who is owning the improvements on that end product? Uh, you wanna make sure that you're not left to a situation, there is no clarity on these issues. So what happens when we part ways and um, you know, we, cease using, uh, we cease using the data and the algorithms, like what is the exit strategy there? And I don't know, Karima, just um, jumping to you at all, if you wanted to chime in on any of these sure, things yeah. so far. So yeah, if we talk about the joint venture and collaboration aspect, of course, that's something that is innate in the supercluster arrangements, the digital supercluster arrangements, because the whole nature of these projects is all about sharing information, sharing data, uh, doing joint inventions, doing joint development. And so sometimes, you know, when we're doing some of these agreements, it can be painful for companies to sit there and go, well, we're really not that far along. So should we be be having should we be forced to have these discussions around who owns what you know what are the terms around sharing data what are the terms around residual obligations 
uh, joint ownership, all those things. I think it's really important right at the outset before you start working on a project to deal with those things and to actually even start a step back and start thinking about confidentiality and what that means. I mean, I think, Natalie, we've both seen examples where people think, well, an NDA is a standard document. I'm just going to sign it. I'm not going to pay much attention to it. But when you're dealing with sophisticated organizations, it's not uncommon to see somebody slip in a warranty or a license or you know, not limit the purpose for which that discussion is supposed to take place, or somebody to think, well, we're gonna go down the path of actually having an agreement through the super cluster or some other arrangement. And so um, you know, thinking about the fact that you might not have that, that agreement doesn't exist as of yet. So how does confidentiality, confidentiality apply even before the transaction? And I think you touched on the fact that, you know, think about, you know, who you're sharing information with, but also think really carefully about what information you share. So even when you have a confidentiality agreement, think very carefully about what they actually need to know, because it's great to have a confidentiality agreement, but having to go to court and enforce one can be really difficult. And so my general approach is keep it at a high level, make sure that even if you have an NDA, try and think about other protection mechanisms that you might have in place like patents for example or provisional patent filing um, and limit like even with your employees does everybody need to know I mean given the mobility as you you know talked about the mobility of the workforce we really do need to think about um, where these people are going what they actually need to know because you may have the best employment agreement but you can't control where they go and what they do afterwards and that process can be very costly to try and enforce and so you know those are some of the practical considerations and so you know you'll see as you as you work work through these if you're involved in these super cluster projects work through these projects you'll see that we have tried to put some rigor around this and it may seem painful at the outset but yeah. there is a reason for that pain so yeah and i think that kind of segues nicely into again, the oversharing problem, right? So a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of companies, particularly on the software side are saying, you know, well, we're, we're not, we're not patenting. Our, our, our strategy is really one of um, open source licensing. We maintain certain things as trade secrets and, um, you know, going after registered IP rights, maybe they have a trademark, but trade secrets are an important aspect. Well, well, how are they protected internally within your company? And so again, it's just coming back to this, you know, what are you sharing? What are you sharing internally? Who has access to what? Um, do you have policies in place around, around trade secrets? Because later on, if there is a trade secret theft, you're going to actually have to prove, if you want to bring an action, you need to actually show that you've taken steps to protect that trade secret that are really um, commensurate with the type of trade secret and the type of protection that you would reasonably expect for that type of, of secret information. So how is it protected? And, you know, this is just a tidbit of information, but, you know, some companies talk is really geared for the small, medium sized enterprise in the digital space. But when we look at really big players globally, I mean, um, Taiwan Semiconductor, uh, TSMC, for example, they recently disclosed not their trade secrets, but they actually have a catalog of 150,000 trade secrets that they're managing through a policy. And um, that was kind of some interesting information to see like sort of at the, the gold standard, this is, this is sort of how this, this, this gets, this gets uh, handled within very sophisticated actors. And, and so again, so who has access? Do you have a policy? You know, what is happening with key employees who have access when they leave to go to a competitor? Like, have you thought those things through? I mean, if you don't think your employees are getting headhunter calls every week, you know, think again. Um, it's a very competitive job market. People are mobile, people are moving and you you potentially could lose your key employees. So you've gotta be thinking about the, that proprietary uh, information. How are you protecting that within the company? So again, the trade secrets. And this is, this is an issue kind of near and dear to my heart that I really think is important that is very misunderstood, which is freedom to operate from an IP perspective. So do you have the freedom to operate in the markets where you do business um, based on the IP landscape? So based on what's out there. So a lot of times companies will come in and say, well, you know, Nat, you did, you, you know, we had this invention, we patented it. You gave me a patentability opinion. You told me it was really great uh, that we could manage to get a patent. But now you're telling me that there's this other patent out there that could prevent me from selling my product. Well, patents, don't give you the right to monopolize a market. What a patent does, it's, it's a positive right to exclude someone, it's exclusionary right to exclude someone from, from doing what you've patented in the marketplace. 
that doesn't mean you have a positive right to do anything. If you think about a pharmaceutical uh, product, uh, you know, you get a patent for a drug, does that mean you can go out and start selling your drug? No, there are regulatory, um, there's a regulatory framework that will ensure that you, you get into the marketplace once you've gone through all the regulatory hurdles. So it's not a patent just enables you to exclude someone from working that same invention, but it's not enabling you to do anything. And so if you look at, you know, this will be another Kareem example, but if you look at your smartphone, um, you know, there's on average 250,000 patents associated with uh, your smartphone. So just because you might have a patent to, um, you know, something to do with the case or some kind of, you know, material uh, for the, you know, for the glass or, or what have you, that does not give you the ability to now build a smartphone. You are going to need to get into some kind of licensing regime and license the other 249,000 patents you're going to need to actually build this product. But really what you're going to do is you're going to get into some kind of supply chain um, and, you know, sell your product into some kind of supply chain. But in any event, you need to make sure, coming back to freedom to operate, you know, do you have the right to operate in those markets? Are there patents, you know, for example, patents are jurisdictional. So you are maybe free to operate in Canada, but is there a patent blocking you in the US market? Is there a patent blocking you in the Asian market, like for example, China or Japan? So being mindful of what patents can be there or what trademarks, you know, what kind of, you're selling your product under what brand? Uh, is your brand, maybe your brand that's trademarked here in North America is fine, but you didn't bother to do a search in, in Asia and you didn't bother to figure out whether that, that mark is something that actually can be used. Maybe someone's rightfully using it in China and now you're blocked. You do not have the freedom to operate in China under that trademark because it's not available to you. So the same applies for other forms of right too, like design rights. Um, as well. And designs, you know, we have graphical user interfaces that can be protected through designs as well. So, you know, understanding, you know, as you move into new markets, are there intellectual property rights that block you? And then the other thing with freedom to operate is, you know, what kinds of warranties are you making these agreements? So I see this all too often where smaller companies are agreeing because they just, they want to get the contract. They want to work with that bigger player and they warrant that they that you know their software does not infringe any patents. And so I always say to them, how do you know that? Have you done any patent searching? Why would you warrant that? Why would you maybe not soften that to say you are not aware of any patents that you might infringe? Uh, because all too often, if you're going with that template agreement that you're getting from, uh, I don't know, you know, some bigger player, that's going to be in there. They're going to expect you to warrant that. And you know, a lot of companies are not doing patent searching, uh, especially the smaller ones. I mean, they should be, but a lot of times they're not. So be very careful about what you're warranting. And maybe it's time to start doing some patent searching and to be looking at what's out there and make sure that you don't have uh, patents that may block you that create risk for you. But be very careful if you're not doing freedom to operate searching, don't make warranties that your product doesn't infringe other patents or other IP rights when you have no idea about that. I don't know, Kareem, if you wanted to chime in there. Yeah, and, and I mean, the other, from a, a business perspective, doing a free to operate analysis actually gives you some intelligence as to what's happening in the competitive landscape. Are you entering a space that's already really crowded? It may not be crowded in North America, but it might be crowded in, in Europe, for example. And so it does give you that information. And, and a freedom to operate analysis, I think, is, is kind of um, dependent, the, the degree in which you engage in that exercise is, is dependent on your risk tolerance. So, you know, you could spend a ton of money and do a really comprehensive one. And at the end of the day, you still don't have any assurances, but you will have spent, you could spend, I mean, Natalie, I can tell you that when I was in this smart space, <laughs> because of the fact that there were so many patents, we could have done that till, you know, till we were blue in the face and we still wouldn't have any assurances. And so you do have to figure out where that line is yeah. um, for your own risk tolerance, depending on the industry in which you're operating, depending on the competitive landscape. But it is a really important activity, not just from a legal standpoint, but from a business standpoint, because it gives you a lot of intelligence. Well, exactly. And where I see this coming up is, you know, take, take a look at your competitors. So where I see, you know, sometimes SMEs, uh, you know, coming up and pitting up against other SMEs is where, you know, one company in the digital space will start to get really successful and might take some customers away from another company. And that's when you see a company start to dust off its patent and say, hey, I actually took, went to the trouble of patenting. And what you're doing actually is encroaching on what I have in terms of my patent rights. And so I, I do see like those kinds of instances coming up, um, particularly in the 
software space. So that's where I would start. Like you're right, you cannot spend, there's not enough money to, to, to search the patent registers constantly. I mean, that's not necessarily the wise, but taking, doing a little bit of preventative work, like thinking really about who your competitors are and keeping an eye on, do they patent anything? Maybe they don't have patents and that's kind of, a, that's a good thing to know. But maybe they do have a very active patent strategy. So if you see a, a list of patents, read them. I mean, you can do that yourself before you even engage with a patent attorney. You know, plug into the U.S. patent database the names of your competitors, and 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 you can constrain those searches through keywords. You know, do a little bit of searching yourself to take a look and see. You know, are they active in that area? And you might be surprised by what you find, and that may start to help you think through. Well, what kinds of um, you know risk management do we need to do around this in terms of the IP space? So monitoring competitor IP rights is a really good good strategy as a starting point. Um, so yeah, again, a good offense is a good defense. You know, and think about getting applications on file yourself. If you find those competitors are filing, you may want to be looking at a strategy of your own and be protecting sort of those things that really. Give give you that competitive uh, edge of the market with what's different about your product. Um, and so, you know, when we think about, again, in the digital space, and we think about, you know, companies who are really doing this well, we, you know, we've got Microsoft, we've got Amazon. I mean, Jeff Bezos has 150 patents to his own name as an inventor. What kinds of things are they protecting? You know, they have their software code. Uh, and so that's going to be protected through copyright. The Amazon trademark, hugely powerful uh, goodwill wrapped into that, that trademark registration. Uh, they've got a lot of process data and they've got a lot of proprietary um, algorithms and things that they're running that would that will form the basis of trade secrets for that company. They also have a lot of business method patents. And this is just an illustration of, you know, the one click, the ability to shop online with a single action, such as a click of a mouse. You know, that was a subject of, of, of a patent. And then, you know, their, their user interfaces, they've got very distinct user interfaces. You think about the Google landing page, that's also the subject of a GUI design patent. So these companies are using all sorts of forms of, of intellectual property rights and have a strategy to really protect themselves. I mean, this is kind of the, the highest level, but you can, but by seeing what some of the bigger players are doing, it can kind of inform in terms of what your own strategy should look like. And this is important because. You know, I wanted to get into stats here a little bit, but you know, IP filings are not going away. If you look at, statistically speaking, this orange bar and this gray bar, the gray is patent filings as they've increased internationally in the millions. And then if you add utility models, which is something that if you're not aware what utility models are, they are a form of patent. They are a less expensive, cheaper form of patent that can be a strategic tool. Um, not always available for software, but they are available for system claims and for things that relate back to hardware. But if you combine those numbers, and we were talking about numbers into the order of like annually patent files of six to seven million annually globally. Trademarks is not even on this graph because it's gone in the last decade from five million trademark applications to 15 million trademark applications. So just to give you a sense of why this, you know, we talk about IP rights, this stuff matters. And 70% of patents applications filed today are for software. They cover computer implemented inventions, 70% of patent filings. And when we look at PCTs, PCT is, the, is a form of what we call international patent application. We again, continue to see this, this continued interest in filing international patent applications. And most recently, you know, up until 2019, the US was the dominant player when it came to filing PCTs. Well, China has now surpassed them. China is continuing on this tear of filings and uh, has moved ahead in terms of the sheer number of international patent files, which then lead into what we call national patents. Uh, and and, and look, let's look at Canada. Uh, you know, we are behind Sweden, which is, 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 is not great given that, um, you know, we are, you know, three, four times the population, but, you know, we, we have, a, a, we, you know, we're filing internationally much less than some of these other countries. And you know, Saudi Arabia, interestingly enough, is looking to really diversify. I was teaching a course this fall uh, with them, and you know, they've increased their PCT fines by 73% uh, from 2019 to 2020, which I thought was interesting. So they're really trying to diversify and get into this patent game as well. And then, you know, from from let's just talk about you know an area uh, like artificial intelligence. You know, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office just issued a report in 2020 uh, tracing the diffusion of AI with U.S. patents and said, look. I mean, from 2002 to 2018, we've seen a 100% increase going from 30,000 to more than 60,000 annually. 
um, which is, means that the share of patent applications now, today, that, that contain AI grew from 9% to 16%. And on the right here, what I'm showing you is not patent applications, but showing you sheer counts. IBM has 46,752 patents, granted patents in AI. Microsoft coming second here with 22,000. So just give you a list. I mean, these are actually granted rights that, you know, potentially, I mean, you know, who knows what these companies are going to do. We haven't seen a lot of litigation in the AI space, patent litigation, but, you know, you would think that no one's accumulating these things for the fun of it. They are being accumulated for business reasons. And, and so, you know, time will tell whether, you know, if we see the kind of patent litigation we've been seeing in kind of the mobile space, whether we'll see that in AI. But here, here's where it really comes back to the SMEs. What's the value of these IP rights? Well, you know, Every year, there's just a new study coming out showing that, you know, SMEs that have at least one registered IP right earn 55% more revenue per employee than SMEs with no registered IP. And SMEs that own both patents and registered trademarks generate 75% more revenue and grow faster than SMEs with no registered IP rights. This isn't necessarily causation, but this is strong correlation. And what I think what it's telling us is companies that are thinking about what they do better what is giving them a competitive edge in the market space? Our companies are succeeding, right? They're, they're, they're understanding what's going on in the global marketplace. They're understanding from an IP point of view what, what their competitors are doing. And this is enabling them to just to grow faster, get higher valuations and succeed. So, you know, food for thought, this is the latest study, you know, European Patent Office, February 2021. Uh, but there's been time and time again, we're seeing these, these numbers come out. Um, so I don't know if, uh, Karima, you wanted to speak to any of that and jump in here at all, but. Um... I mean, I, I think from my perspective, I am, I'm a big proponent of, of filing patents, filing obviously for trademark protection that I think goes without saying. Um, but I do think that there has to be a consideration of a holistic portfolio of IP rights. And so, you know, at the very least, even if you think you're too small to have a registered IP right, you, you sort of do de facto have to consider at least some of the basic things and then processes around the other types of um, IP rights that you might actually be able to rely on. And I agree with Natalie that, you know, it's a degree of awareness, it's a degree of understanding, it's a degree of how you might maneuver yourself. I mean, I think if you think about IP, it gives you the ability to um, not just compete, it gives you the ability to attract investment, it allows you to sort of differentiate yourself in the marketplace. So it has a whole bunch of other intangible value that I think companies need to think about. And, and so, you know, as, as more government programs are coming into place that support these kinds of registration rights, et cetera, I think, I think companies would be well advised to look at those opportunities. Great, all, all excellent points. And, and, and so I think this is just really important. Again, it's just for, for SMEs, for small, medium-sized companies to keep in mind that the big players are strategic. They're, you know, they have, you know, they have, a, they have IP strategy in them some. And so, you know, the SMEs continue to be at a disadvantage. And yet we know innovation is coming from these small, innovative companies. And, the, you know, in October of 2020, the U.S. Uh, issued an antitrust report saying, you know, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google increasingly serve as gatekeepers of commerce and communications in the digital age. And so we need to be aware um, of the challenges for companies moving in the market. They, you know, we need to be that much smarter. These smaller companies, and Canada is a country of SMEs. So if we really want to succeed, we are going to need to be very strategic in this global marketplace. And it's a competitive global marketplace. Um, you know, Wall Street Journal, there's a link to this article, but, you know, the Wall Street Journal, um, you know, they, they, this is a recent headline, Amazon met with startups about investing and launch competing products, you know, and, and they can launch competing products. You know, we may have been naive, but if you, if you're this little company and you've come up with this widget and you didn't bother to patent it or get any sort of design rights to it, they can't copy your copyright, of course, but they can come up with something that's very similar and out compete with you. That's just business. And so, you know, you think you're having a conversation with the friendly giant, but the friendly giant is operating with a view to a profit. Okay. And so if the friendly giant can outcompete you, the friendly giant's going to outcompete you. And this is not, you know, this isn't necessarily Amazon being mean, but you know, this is just, this is business. So if you want to have a conversation with, with Amazon, do that once you've thought about your IP strategy. Um, same thing with Ecobee. This is a story right out of Canada. Ecobee was a Canadian company headquartered here in Ontario. Uh, smart thermostats is what they were selling. 
they got into these agreements with Amazon where Amazon was leveraging its market dominance, which you know it's entitled to do unless it's been unless unless there's an antitrust or anti-competitive situation, it can do these things. And um, you know, this is just coming from the Wall Street Journal article again, but you know, agreements, they got into a situation where they were able to pressure Ecobee into sharing user data, which is not what Ecobee wants to do because they felt they'd be in violation of the trust they have with their users, putting Ecobee in a very difficult situation with how's it going to grow because. Amazon wants X, its users want something else. And this is again about reading the fine print. You got into an agreement that wasn't gonna enable you to scale on your terms. You are gonna have to scale on Amazon's terms. So again, reading, reading the fine print and understanding where you're headed. And this is a great story. Um, this is a story about a Toronto-based company going back to the late nineties, but you know, a small Toronto-based company, eye for eye, they went and obtained a US patent on an XML editor. So we'll take you back down. Uh, history lane here, but they approached, after they had filed for patent protection though, they approached Microsoft about this XML editor and they approached one of their dev teams and said, what do you guys think about this? And they took a look at it. They said, you know, not interested, but thanks for, thanks for showing us. It ended up that this, this patented invention ended up in Microsoft's product. And so Microsoft uh, ended up in a legal battle with I4I. I4I ended up getting venture capital funding to take Microsoft all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and ended up winning uh, a very large order against Microsoft and included a, an injunction and a requirement to stop sales that included um, the patented invention. So, so this is a story where, you know, this company took the right approach. They, they patented first, and then they had the chat with the friendly giant. And then when it didn't work out, they, were, they had recourse. Um, this is this is headlines today. Adabotics, you know, this is a Calgary-based company. They're going after now a Massachusetts-based company with their with their patents. I mean, this is a story again of a small, medium-sized company that uh, is now going to have to assert its IP. Well, thank goodness they have patents. And uh, most recently, if you looked at the headlines, you know, now we're seeing Sonos have a successful um, uh, battle with Google, and uh, it's again over patents. We're looking at Sonos enforcing over a hundred patents against Google. So again, I mean, you know, without that, without that protection, where would these companies be? And so it's just a, a reminder that you know these things keep coming up at the headlines. And so I'm not saying patenting strategy is for everyone, but you know, it can be. It can be very helpful in this very competitive uh, marketplace. And so just kind of coming back. And Karima, feel free to jump in as well. But just kind of coming back to three kind of key points we really want digital companies to be thinking about is, you know, your contracting practices. I mean, this is where your intangible assets get wrapped up, you know, in licenses and partner agreements. And you do need to be thinking about IP strategy when you're thinking about your contracting practices. Patenting considerations. Maybe you don't want to patent, but you should be thinking about the competitive landscape in terms of what your competitors patent. Uh, trade secret protection as well, you know, thinking about what policies, how do you, you know, when a key employee leaves that has access to a trade secret, you know, what does that look like? Do you have anything um, set out around that in terms of handover, in terms of, um, you know, making sure that they understand their obligations uh, to maintain, you know, company information as, as confidential that they move on to the competitor? So what, what processes and procedures do you have in place? Um, so I, I think before I jump to Fortress Agreement, yeah, no, I, I think, Natalie, you've covered it. I think it's important for organizations to understand that patenting and trade secret protection aren't mutually exclusive. You layer you layer all the different forms of IP rights and, and contracts is another way of, of securing protection. You know, I think it does take a lot of what I call intestinal fortitude to sue somebody, particularly if you're suing somebody who's a large player. But what, it, what you can do by virtue of a patent is make yourself less vulnerable to being... Um, finding yourself where you're actually having a discussion with somebody and then them incorporating that idea into your product and you having very little recourse. At least it gives them pause for thought to say, you know, mm -hmm. there is that that there is that right that I do need to be thinking about, right? So as much as when, you know, when people yeah. go in and say, we've got NDAs in place, make sure that you let them know that you also have provisional patents or patent applications that you filed yeah. just so it's it's just a deterrent. It's just a natural Counsel deterrent. prevention. I agree because I mean I don't litigate. I but I do a lot of what I call pre-litigation work, which is where, you know, we are claim charting. We are dealing with patents being asserted, and 
you know, a lot of things get settled. That's the reality. A lot of these things are not hitting the headlines. And if you've been, you know, intentional, you've been careful, you've, you know, you have a few patents, you, you know, you've gone about things in a way uh, that's strategic, you know, we're not hearing about you in the headlines because you're, you're handling your business in a way that's, that's enabling you to move more freely. Now, sometimes it's hard to avoid as you get bigger, you're just going to be a target, but um, for the SMEs, I mean, it's just about, yeah, being very intentional, being careful in that way. So, um, so I wanted to, to jump, jump gears here and, um, talk about, uh, the software platform that I've launched. Oh, um, sorry, there's that just jumped around here and introduce my, my co-founder general as well. Uh, so we've launched, um, uh, an IP management plat an IP software management platform. And I wanted to, I don't know if she's spotlighted. There you are, Jen. Okay. I can see you now. <laughs> uh, so my, uh, my longtime friend, actually general Ull, uh, co-founder, uh, of fortress.legal with me is joining you right now. And you can see her as well, as well as, uh, Sam Murray, who has recently joined us from Shopify as our VP of marketing and customer success. So we're really excited to just talk a little bit about the product because, you know, it was kind of doom and gloom here talking about IP strategy and, you know, there are solutions out there to help SMEs. And that's really in my work and Jen's work working with companies for the last 20 years as IP attorneys, we just felt like, my gosh, it, you know, there's just, there, there's, there's something missing here for smaller companies. And we set out a couple of years ago to set out to solve that problem. And what we have really today is, you know, uh, the only secure SaaS web platform to help small, medium-sized businesses easily, affordably, and intelligently manage their IP, their contracts, their corporate data so they can grow faster and achieve higher valuations. And so just kind of quickly before I show you a quick product demo, I just wanted to kind of set the stage as why this matters. Um, and what we what we set out to do, sorry, I didn't realize there was a bit of animation in this one. Um, what we set out to, uh, let me, I think I can, ah, I don't know. I think this, okay. Having a glitch here. Maybe if I hold my mouse, it'll stop moving. How do I pause this? Oh my goodness. Oh, here we go. Let me. This is just frustrating. Sorry, I think somehow there ended up being an, an, an animation in this. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna flip through this quickly, but um to to kind of give you a sense here. Uh, actually, this is really, this is not going to work. So let me just, um, let me just stop, pause the share for a sec. And I tested this beforehand. I'm not sure how this, um, let me, give me one second. I'm going to flip to a PDF version so we can just avoid this uh, craziness here. Okay. Okay, uh, resume share. Can you, can someone just let me know if they can see this PDF document? Okay, great, sorry about that. Okay, uh, so all to say is, and you will get a copy of these slides afterwards if anyone's interested in knowing that. So in terms of the technology gap, what we realized was there, you know, big companies, you know, they're managing their IP really well. We talked about Amazon, what do they have? They've got, they've got IP departments, they have patent agents, trademark agents, you know, IP lawyers, licensing experts. They have, you know, big IT departments to help them deploy great software to help them manage their intellectual property assets and their contracts. Um, and, and so, you know, what do the small companies have? I mean, you need to get to a fairly large size as a small company before you even hire your first lawyer. Oftentimes, you know, in a company up to 50, sometimes to 100 people, you've got uh, maybe your HR person handling all your contracts. Uh, and there isn't someone inside that's an IP expert. You might have a lawyer in house, but they're typically, a, you know, they typically have expertise in corporate law. They might have expertise in employment law, but they're not going to have IP expertise. So, you know, you don't have that expertise in house. You're dealing with outside counsel. And, and how are you dealing with outside counsel when you get this information? Well, we know at the moment, a lot of, a lot of folks are keeping this information in email. It's sitting in maybe your Google drives. Slack, Dropbox, like this information you're getting from your IP counsel and your lawyers is often sitting everywhere. And so there is a lack of organization, there's a lack of guidance. 
And then what happens, it creates a pain point, not just for you as the small, medium-sized company and managing your IP assets and your corporate data, but it's also a pain point for the lawyers because we have to spend time keeping you organized, giving you the same information over and over again. And so it creates a frustration. It gets expensive, which nobody likes. And so really we need to improve um, prove that. So what we've built is a platform to really help innovative, small, medium-sized companies to work and share information with their IP and legal advisors, with the incubators and funders to the extent that they want to understand you know, what kinds of, um, you know, what kinds of patents do you now have? Uh, how can we help you uh, with their, with their investors, maybe with their customers, they want to be sharing agreements with those customers so they get them signed more, more efficiently. So Fortress is really a multi-sided platform that you can now connect with all different types of parties, including investors, including lawyers, uh, including customers, and do that in a really secure way. And so really what we're offering is an integrated offering where you're bringing together contract management, IP asset management, the virtual data room, which a lot of SMEs need to get organized to do in order to raise money, and secure cloud storage, which a lot are using anyway. A lot of stuff is being maintained in all these kind of Dropbox, Google Drive um, offerings. So we, we know folks are using that. And so by bringing that together in a product that's right size and right price for SMEs, uh, this is what Fortress, Fortress Legal is trying to offer into, into the marketplace. So let's do, I'd like to do a demo and um, let me stop the uh, share for one minute so I can just pop that up and share again, just to show you. So we excitingly, and uh, can I just confirm, I can see the, the demo now, great. Uh, so, you know, what, we, what we've got, we've got some companies now on here already using Fortress, it's already out there, so we're excited and we, we're looking for more companies to come in and, and law firms actually uh, to collaborate with us as well if they want to join too. But just to give you a little bit of a drive through this, what, when you come onto the dashboard, what you have here is a menu that enables the companies to really start to organize around what is unregistered IP and registered IP and start to think through that. Um, and so what we have is in the unregistered IP, we've built out a contracts manage module to enable companies to start to manage their contracts. And I'll show you that. And we will be, we will be building out subsequent mod modules around copyright, ideation capture, because we know companies have all these great ideas, but where do those go? Trade secret management, and open source, and then also be able to manage your registered IP. And we've started with the two most common forms, patents and trademarks, but we know that folks also register their designs which can be for now captured in patents and copyright and plant breeders rights, which is gonna be more interesting to the, uh, to the cannabis companies who are now coming up with all these varietals. But um, so for now, we've got these two forms of IP and you're able to organize your information. And so if you go into patents, um, you pick, you know, as I said, you can have also be managing multiple companies if you have affiliate companies, but you would come in, you'd pick a company, Demo Inc. And so Demo Inc has a couple of patents now. They have uh, a patent called Antenna, They've nicknamed it uh, Moxie. They have a widget. They've nicknamed Pluto. And so they're able to capture that information in here. And so if you come into, let's say, widget, you're able to look at the patent family and find the information very easily in here. And so uh, in this case, on the widget, they filed two applications. They're able to come into uh, the, you know, the widget one, which is a provisional application, see just the basic information that they need to see, and then uh, under on the timeline. So in this case, they've just recently, they just, they're just about to file it. So they have a patent application. You can find the documents in here. Um, they've got drawings and they're able to see and follow the process, which is in a patent process, you've got, um, you file the application that it publishes and you have office actions and responses. It gets allowed, it gets granted. There might be documents for signature. And then what's neat in all of these different sections is you're able to write notes, for example, to your attorney. So you can write a note to your attorney. You can Share that you can write a private note to yourself about a particular patent and then come back to that and share that later. Um, so those are the kind of neat features and trademarks is set up the same way with trademark families you're able to go in and see your various trademarks. If you come into, you know, a particular one like XYZ design these are just sort of samples you're able to follow along the process of trademarks so you file the trademark application you might have a logo associated with that there's going to be a back and forth with the trademark office. And it's all by jurisdiction, so Canada, US. So it helps the companies to really follow along where they are in the process. And then for contracts, uh, you know, where are you managing your contracts? So here, I mean, for example, if you were to, if Sprint was a client, 
you know, let's say you want to manage your, your agreements with Sprint, you could come into your Sprint contract family um, and, and come into the contracts. And maybe the first thing you do with Sprint is you put an NDA together. So you come in, you have a non-disclosure agreement with Sprint. It's a waiting review. Um, so you're able to put, you know, things about the effective date, expiry date in here. Um, at this point, you can also add information about milestones. So when do you want to be reminded to go and remind Sprint to sign uh, the, the NDA? Uh, information about signatory. So once it's executed, this information changes to execute. So this shows that this is like, this is a sample, obviously, but it shows that it's been executed. And then in here, you're able to save all your versions and have that organized as opposed to just throwing everything into a Dropbox folder, or Google Share. Now, you know, you can keep your templates in here. Um, your working versions, your final version that went out for signature, the actual executed version, because as I can tell you, as a lawyer on the outside working with companies, we're always asking, well, where's the signed version? What was the final version? To this? Because that's what's going to get enforced. That's what you're going to need to dust off in a dispute is the actual signed copy. Um, so we don't want to see the, you know, five versions before the executed. We really need to see that executed. And then again, you have the notes feature. And what's uh, really neat is that we've given the ability for companies now to maintain their corporate documents. So you can see if you wanted to also have your other forms of intangible assets or corporate records, shareholder information, uh, financial information, you could store that in here. Um, other things about policies, capital assets, those can be stored in here. We have a guidance section as well. So different types of IP, and you can get definitional information on that. And as we grow this system, we plan on having um, you know, micro content. So for example, trade secrets, we have some basic definitional, but we plan to have, you know, short videos, really quick information, micro content, so that companies are getting access to international guidance that is right size for them. They don't have to go and read, you know, pages and pages of information. They can get that really quick micro guidance. And then the exciting feature, last feature I want to show you is the ability to, to produce reports. So producing, being able to generate quickly a report on your contracts, for example, or your patents. And, and know what's coming up next. And so with a quick um, click here, and I'm gonna bring this over, you're able to right away uh, see where you are with your patents. Um, and so here it gives you the IDs. You can now sort on this information. You can create notes on this information and it's at your fingertips versus a lot of companies, you know, they when they want these kind of reports, because an investor is asking, well, you know, you have patents or you have contracts, what, show me your top, you know, five customer agreements, you can pull that report and say, you know, we've got five, these are our five, top five customer agreements and they are set to renew three years from now. So we're all good. Um, you know, this, this is the kind of information that you want to be able to have access to quickly and through Fortress, um, you're able to access that and not have to wait for your attorney or their paralegal or whoever. Um, it's there, it's organized and it's organized in a structure that, um, you know, that is goes beyond what you what you'll find in a Dropbox or a Google share because they're not going to have, you know, all of these great uh, folders um, for you to be able to see as, as I went back to with the widget. Um, you know, this kind of organizational structure, this is already there for you, you don't need to go and recreate the structure every time so you know what your granted patent looks like you're not going and fishing through. Uh, 30 documents because one thing I will say about the IP process is to, to, to get a patent, it takes about three to five years uh, on average. And trademarks are taking the Canadian trademark office right now is, is up is up past the three year delay in terms of issuing its first office action. So the problem for companies is that are, that are small is that you're going back and you're sort of saying, okay, well, what did we file? Like, what does the logo look like for that trademark? And um, you know, not remembering. And so having that information at your fingertips you know, is helpful to companies so that they can really, oh, geez, we changed that logo. We're not selling under that logo anymore. We don't use that trademark anymore. Or why are we paying for this patent? You know, we don't sell a product that covers this patent anymore. We actually switched gears. So having line of sight on that is really important. And right now what we found is, is, is just companies just don't. So, um, so I'm going to stop there. I know that was a mouthful. And um, I know there are like 16 things in the chat that I haven't looked at, but um, Thanks so much, well, Natalie. We do have a couple of questions. Um, so maybe mm -hmm. uh, Jen and I can kind of go through those. Um, we had a question from Sam asking, how do you ensure security of your documents and where are your servers located on Fortress Legal? 
Yeah, so so right now we're, we're on the AWS platform and it, it's uh, all the information is being encrypted. And um, and right now the servers are resident in Canada. We do have ability for companies because uh, we are looking, this is gonna be a global product. We are looking to onboard companies outside of Canada. So we will be able to meet those residency requirements, the GDPR requirements. Uh, but yeah, definitely uh, very secure, but we are, we are using AWS. And if, and if anyone wants to know more, I know our, our, our CTO is actually Warren Gallagher, a uh, 30 year veteran, uh, has, you know, has had, you know, many companies. And so he's just fantastic. We're excited to have him here. I know he's in the audience too, but if you want to have more of a technical discussion about um, how we're built, uh, how we're securely built and, and what we're doing to make sure that folks data is protected, um, let us know, reach out, we'd be happy to answer more questions. Perfect. And for some of the more um, sort of detailed questions, I know as we're going into the last couple minutes of time, if we don't get to your question um, here, then we'll also we have your contact details. So we will uh, reach out and, and, and provide those those updates. I think maybe as, as we look at sort of what you've covered, one of the questions would be, um, you know, who within an organization should be tasked with dealing with IP? You know, we've kind of covered on the one side, you know, the different layers of protection and how paramount this is. And on the platform side, maybe just to kind of summarize some of that for us on the call. That's great. I, so I think small companies should really set up an IP committee. And I think what you want to be looking at is having someone from, from design or technical on like the head of technical on there or someone that, you know, has that kind of seniority. I think you want the business leadership, someone from the business leadership on that committee. And then I also think from the sales marketing side, you want someone on that committee because I think everyone needs to know like, where are we headed market wise? What's our go-to market strategy? Where are we going? Where are we headed? Because that will also inform your IP strategy, but we also need to have a keen eye on what we've actually built. What are our differentiators? Um, what was really challenging to, to make? What was really challenging to create? Because that may be where some of those that some of those really important IP assets reside. And then, you know, you're not going to you're not going to protect everything. And, you're, you know, there's some risk. And Kareem and I talked about this before that, you know, there's only so I mean, small companies have budgets and they have to live within those budgets. So it is about taking on a certain amount of risk, but being intentional about that risk and saying, you know what, we are going to agree to that with that big company because we really want to partner with them. But know your deal breakers. If you are going to agree with a company, know why you're agreeing with to, to something and know what you won't agree to and really hold strong to those. Um, and I see that like small companies here that are really careful about what their deal breakers are, like their you know, indemnifications, like the maximum liability they'll, they'll, um, you know, they'll accept and things like that. They argue hard about that and other things they'll let go on. Um, just knowing what your what your deal breakers are but the committee should really i think it should be kind of your sales marketing business and um you know uh technical you know your technical engineering side and i don't know if you wanted to add to yeah. that to your yeah. I, think, I think the thing i would add is it doesn't reside in any particular place it's sort of dispersed throughout the organization and mm -hmm. that tone needs to come from the top yeah, right absolutely. i think it needs it, you know, we can have all the committees in the world. And if there isn't that senior leadership buy off, those policies and whatever practices you have in place aren't going to be implemented and, and followed through on. So I, I agree with Natalie. And I think it's it's sort of an organizational context and with with real backing from the executive. And, and just to kind of uh, you know, tie this part up around um, sort of the risks is, is there also sort of another sort of layer to this for those that are working in jurisdictions, say, for example, where there is also less respect for, you know, IP rights and those challenges. So there's, there's what an organization is, is doing, but do you also have a layer there to, to, to share with people? Yeah, I mean, I think that's changing. Uh, you know, people used to say, well, I'm not filing in China. They don't respect IP rights. I mean, we, we were seeing, you know, we always said when, when China gets into the game of IP in terms of IP rights, they're going to be respecting them. And so, you know, when I, I prior to the pandemic, I was over there, you know, a number of times and, and hearing, you know, statistically speaking, you know, success that foreign companies are having and bringing actions over there. So I think that's all changing. I think the last five years, a lot of that has changed. Um, but it can be challenging. I know in, in, in litigating in, in jurisdictions, um, it can be, you know, just operating in those jurisdictions can be challenging, but then that's what you want to think about. You know, maybe you're not, you're, you're going to have to find a neutral place to, to, to resolve disputes. Maybe it's not Canada, maybe it's not India, but maybe it's, you know, New York. Um, so figuring out where you want to be, um, when things kind of, um, you know, hit the fan and, and, and you've got problems. 
Um, that's only one aspect of it, but I think, you know, I think countries are changing and I think um, it, it depends. And as I showed you, Saudi Arabia, like, boy, I mean, some of these countries, they are reorienting and they're reorienting fast uh, because they realize the economy is changing. They want to get into this game of intangible stock assets and uh, they want to diversify. Wonderful, thank you. I know our, our power hour is, is a good hungry hour for everybody with all these tidbits um, and everything that you've shared. Um, I'll, I'll hand it over back to Annika. Um, and as we mentioned, for those questions that uh, we're not able to get to, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll send you all back a response and, and share that as part of um, the, the information. Fantastic, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Prima. Thanks, thank Dan. You. Thanks, everyone. Um, so yeah, just to follow up, um, thank you all so much for attending today's session. Um, it was great seeing so much interest and engagement with the topic and a huge thank you to Karima and Natalie and her team at Fortress Legal for taking the time to share their expertise with us today. Um, following this session, you'll receive a follow-up email with links to this recording, the presentation. Um, again, as Jen mentioned, addressing those questions that we didn't get to, we'll make sure to answer those as well. Um, and this is the first of many Supercluster events that we'll be hosting this year, so please keep an eye out in our monthly events bulletin um, sent out on the second Wednesday of the month for our upcoming events. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day.